Conversation is going round. People talking about the colors come to town. Fresh as a summer breeze, should take you by surprise. Good morning and welcome to another fabulous episode of Fresh Waves. I say that every week, but it's true. It's a fabulous day when we've got fresh waves on the air. Sitting across from me so patiently and quietly is the one and only Mary Jo. Hi, Mary Jo. Hi. Thank you for having me again. Well, we really enjoyed having you last year. And I know that because we had a whole lot of guests that day, we barely scraped the surface of the things that you have done. Those who have been tuning in religiously all through the month of April. I'd like them to know who you are and how you end up being here today. So let's start at the beginning of Mary Jo. Okay. Um, I, uh, I was diagnosed with kidney failure when I was 18. Um, or they told me that I was going to be on dialysis at some point. Uh, I come from a family of six people who've had kidney failure. Uh, three of them have passed away, including really? my mom. My mom passed two years ago. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Thank you. Um, so at 18, I was told that I have the same genetic disorder and, uh, they told me with diet, I could probably hold it off. And I tried, I tried a number of different methods, holistic, you know, any, anything you could think of at 18 years old, you think you're invincible. So you just try yeah, everything. That's true. Um, and I was able to hold it off until I was 24. And then I was, uh, I had my fistula put in and I was on dialysis. So yeah, I, I was, I spent nine years on dialysis waiting for a transplant. And I looked at the different options of possibly going to another country and buying an organ. Uh, for me, it wasn't something I was comfortable with, uh, for various reasons. And we, you know, that, that's a long, long conversation. If you want to yes. talk about ethics, we will do that in a little while, but for yeah. now, we're just hearing the story of you. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, uh, after, after about nine years, I got the call. Uh, it was, a. Uh, on the TV screen. I don't know if you remember Rogers used to show up and told you who was calling. And oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it was, it was an unknown number. It was a long distance unknown number. So I just ignored it. Um, and then they called again. And, and at the time my husband was in Scotland. So I thought, okay, well maybe, maybe I should answer the phone in case it's him. Yeah. In case it was him. Yeah. And it was, uh, it was St. Michael's hospital and they said, we have a kidney. How soon can you get here? So, and I had my son at the time and it was kind of like a mad rush to figure out logistics. Cause your life literally changes overnight that mm-hmm. day. That so, day. That day, yeah. They, they, they don't tell you at first, but they actually call three people in. Um, and, and one person ends up going home. So, oh. lucky me, I was, I was, I was able to stay because they actually run a few more tests to make sure Picture. that they have the best match and right. that it's going to be a successful transplant. So me and one other person got the kidney that day and, and the next day I was off dialysis after nine years. Wow. Now you have a child. I do. I have a 13 year old son. And you had that child while you were on dialysis. Yeah. Which back, makes you the first and only or no, first? No. Back but, then I was the third in North America and, wow. and to ever give birth while on dialysis. While on dialysis. It wasn't something people did. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I was a bit of a guinea pig with St. Michael's Hospital. They'd never had anybody do that before. Uh, when I found out I was pregnant, I went to them and said, you know, is this something Oops. I can yeah. do? I didn't even know I could get pregnant, to be honest, and, and it kind of happened. And I was on dialysis at the time, so they agreed to support me, and uh, we did it. And and since then, that I know of, there's 26 of us. Wow. Maybe more, because um, I actually did a, 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 a talk at uh, St. Michael's Hospital for a bunch of nurses who were now supporting uh, women who were having babies on dialysis. Wow. And letting them know it could be done. But I bet it was a tricky process. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it. It was very hard. Um, sleeping on while you're pregnant is tough enough. Never mind sleeping with a needle in your or two needles in your arm. Yeah. Um, and then you have to worry about the machine going off. I mean, there's a lot of things we didn't understand. We didn't understand, you know, how much weight I was actually gaining and how much of it was water weight and how much you can take off through the machine. Uh, there's a lot of chemistry involved there that was really kind of unknown mm-hmm. at the time. So kind of a scary process. I mean, they, they obviously know a lot more about it now, but they didn't then. Right. So we're talking 13 years ago. Mm-hmm. So, but, uh, I have an amazing kid and I'm, I'm very, very fortunate that I was able to do that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. What a gift. Yeah. Gift is upon gifts. Yeah. It's, uh, I'm, I'm very, very lucky and, and I'm, you know, almost, I'm eight and a half years now with my kidney. Wow. So, yeah, so I, I, I'm, I'm sad to hear that Jason's not here, but, uh, I wish him well and I'm, I'm hoping I'll see him 
very soon because mm-hmm. uh, he's a pretty amazing guy. He certainly is. I think every office building, when you when you get off the elevator, there should be a cutout of Jay. <laughs> there should be a happy Jay on every floor of every office building in Toronto. Because I don't think I've ever seen him not smiling. Exactly. Yeah. And you, you need to have one of those in your life. You know, you come in, hey, Brad, how are you? Yeah. <laughs> I'm fine, he's a very, Jay. Very and you? Positive I mean, person. I just got hit by a bus, but I'm doing great. You know, that's just how he is. He's yeah. just the happiest guy in the world. So it's, it's yeah, I, I've met so many amazing people through this process mm-hmm. um and i think that's the people the thing that people forget is yeah it sucks to be sick but at the same time you meet some pretty amazing people and when the people have had the organ donation they've had the transplant they have such a great outlook on life i was saying last week to to jen and and Franz that it's fabulous being around these people yeah they yeah. have such an appreciation for every day of their lives when you've lived on a machine, um, and that's your only way of living, I mean, people think that, oh, you're lucky, you know, you're still alive. Well, it's not really a way of life. It's it's not a whole lot of fun to spend eight hours on a machine, you know, having your blood cleaned and then not being able to eat, not really being able to enjoy your life. Even though, yes, you're still alive, it's not a way, it's not a good way of life. No. So once you've been through that, yeah, absolutely, you have a new appreciation. And all of a sudden, you can travel and you can you can eat food that you couldn't eat before and you can drink water because before you could only eat ice chips you know because you have to worry about your weight gain with water because you can't get rid of it right so there's a lot of things that you're you know you're really limited on when you're on a machine um so yeah you definitely get a new appreciation and and i started i started dragon boating with a whole group of people of uh transplant recipients of every kind you're one of the dragon boaters one of the dragon boaters oh, yeah so with donna fun. donna who was at 40 i think she's 46 years now with her kidney which is i think one of the longest so pretty they're trying to rope jay into being one of the dragon boaters but not to paddle to actually sit at the front and he just be smile. the drummer he can be the drummer that's what i said can you jump jay and he said well um uh he said, How per- about you can shout because he, he can yell at us yes, all. Yes, he's got yeah. that great voice that he does that block party thing with. Hi, it's little Jay. Yeah, it's uh, it's <laughs> stroke. Tough. It's tough to stay in 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 uh, some kind of rhythm. Like yeah. it's, it's a lot harder than you think. But uh, I'm pretty sure he can drum a beat. If he can't, then we've got Tanya Porter in town. She'll get him up to speed with the drumming thing, and then he can just go and do. Oh, his... I believe he can do it. Yeah, I believe in him. I do too. So you did this documentary. How did that documentary? Someone just said, oh, I saw this uh, young, pretty woman in dialysis. I'll get her to be in my documentary. No, it, it actually was so random. It was a neighbor of mine who happened to know somebody who wanted to do a film. They didn't really know what the film would be about. They just knew it wanted to do something about organ donation and awareness. Um, and she referred him to me. And uh, so he came and just talked to me about it, and we just started filming. There was no real direction for the film at the time, and it, it went on for so long that they actually changed directors. And that's when Rick took on the film and uh, just gave it a whole new focus. Um, a new energy kind of thing. Yeah, and just she just what she did with it was pretty amazing. I don't think anybody really knew what she was going to do with it, and I don't think she knew either, and it kind of grew into something, and then... Uh, Oh, I saw the film for the first time when everybody else saw it. Uh, and I, I mean, I'm mind blown what, what she was capable of doing. But the research all- is outstanding. The yeah. research is outstanding. And we had a listener who's also seen the film and, and he said, can you ask how she got that information? Because it's black market stuff. It's not like you can just walk down the street and say, hey, anybody got an organ for sale? You want to talk to me about it? You know, this is not something that you go around broadcasting. So, But she's an investigative journalist. Right. So right? she's so, got the training. She knows how to find these but people. But she's probably one of the best I think I've ever seen. And you can, if anybody, anybody who knows Rick will probably say the same thing. She's very, very good at diving deep mm-hmm. and just following leads. And she doesn't really take no for an answer. She just finds a way. And, uh, I've never seen anybody do it like her. Wow. So, okay. Um, so you, you, you were on dialysis. You ended up having a child, which is just crazy. Yeah. Tell us how it felt when you got that phone call that said they had a kidney for you. Was it kind of like that? Oh my goodness. I'm in labor sort of thing that you're happy, but you're nervous. And it's a pretty surreal experience. I don't think you really understand what's happening when it's happening. Right. Um, and to be honest, after almost nine years, I was not doing so well. I was kind of, my hair was falling out. You know, when you do dialysis for nine years in a row, you're sticking needles in your arms and there's all kinds of problems that go with that over the, over time. Um, I wasn't doing well. 
Like I just wasn't doing well. So when that call came, it couldn't, it was kind of the best time it could have come at. Um, it happened. You have to be well enough to have the transplant, right? That, isn't that what happens to some people? Well, They're on dialysis for too long. That, exactly. That's exactly what happens, which happened to my mom. Actually, my mom was on dialysis for 26 years. Oh my goodness. So she got to a point where she was too sick and couldn't, could no longer have the transplant. And so she had no choice. She had to stay on the machine. Um, and then you don't get better on dialysis. Like it's, it keeps you alive, but you don't get better. You get worse mm-hmm. right? because things just eventually start to break down. A dialysis machine doesn't do what a kidney does. It does a portion of it, mm-hmm. but nowhere near. Everything. And that was your mom in the documentary, wasn't it? Yeah. And it was interesting because that part of the documentary I found fascinating because it did show what dialysis is really like. Yeah. And, you know, you get these, um, glorified, I'll say, visions of now they've painted the room so it looks nice. Jay said when he first started dialysis, it was gray and ugly. And now it's got bright colors. And so they do this pan shot of the dialysis people on the machines. And obviously it's it's not great because you're hooked up to a machine, but the people all look happy. It's a nice serene atmosphere. It's not really noisy. They're watching a movie. That's what you get the impression of, that it's really not that big deal of a deal. It's just time consuming. Yeah. Well, the way your mother portrayed it, you all of a sudden got the real idea. And the way you were portrayed, again, the real idea of what it really is like. And it's not pretty. It's not pretty. And I don't, there's a lot of things that I don't think people understand that go with it. I mean, when you go on dialysis, you got to remember the amount of time that it takes. So you can no longer work like a regular person. You can't eat like a regular person. You can't sleep like a regular person. That takes a toll on you in every way you mm-hmm. can possibly think of. Um, and I, I've seen it happen. I've watched a lot of people die waiting. Um, I've watched them lose their jobs. I've watched them not, they've lost a lot of their family members. Their marriages fall apart. Like it's, it's devastating Mm -hmm. in in every way you can possibly think of. I mean, it's an illness, right? So getting a call, uh, like that is, is a a pretty life changing experience. It's almost shocking. So did you you have a bag pre-packed? No. No. no, God no! Like after I mean, nine years, I mean, you'd probably it would be full of spider webs, and you'd have to wash it all out anyway. You kind of, <laughs> you kind of think it's not going to happen. T- to right. be honest, like at that point, you just you kind of lose hope. I hate to say that, but you do. You kind of lose hope. And I, and again, I'd seen because I was in the hospital and I was in the system. I'd watched a lot of people die waiting, uh, and my neighbor across the street died waiting for a double lung transplant with three kids. So I, I when you see that kind of stuff, it's 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 hard not to despair, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and that's one of the reasons why I got involved in as many things as I have. Uh, and I actually worked with Anna Coco for the last five years in the uh, high school outreach program, going to high schools and talking about, uh, organ donation because it's so unbelievably important. And I don't think it's, I don't think people wouldn't do it. I think they just don't know about Mm -hmm. it. And that's the problem. It's a, a lack of education. Well, our double lung recipient was saying he always flips it around and he says, okay, so you don't really know if you should be an organ donor. So if you needed an organ and someone offered one to you, would you say, well, I'm not really sure I'm into this. That's a a, a (laughs) good way of putting it. (laughs) He said, of course not. So you got to put the shoe on the other foot and say, okay, if I needed an organ, would I hope that someone had signed their the registry, of course. <laughs> you, yeah, I mean, but it's like anything. You can't blame people for not no, that's being... that's true. Because they don't know, right? Unless it's happened to them, happened to somebody they know. My brother's also a recipient. Uh, my brother got his kidney before me, and he did get a live donor. Mm-hmm. Um, and my my cousin uh, just started dialysis two years ago. She's currently waiting for a transplant. Um, so it really does run through your family. There's six of us, and her father passed away before my mom, so brother and sister, uh, and and my grandmother. So all three of them have passed, and me and my brother are the only ones right now with a transplant, and my cousin's still waiting. So yeah, it's affected us pretty intensely, so it's, mm-hmm. it's very important that mm-hmm. I think we continue stepping up the awareness, because again, I think people would do it if they knew about it. Yeah, you're probably right. I think they would. We heard that from a, in a previous show, a woman whose 10 year old had decided that everybody should be an organ donor. That's amazing. 10 years old. And he's standing up at a Thanksgiving dinner. Um, they said grace. And then he said, and everybody should be an organ donor. <laughs> That's amazing. It I mean, is sometimes amazing. you just know what's right. I mean, I think Humboldt really put it on the map, yeah, which is sure did. 
we have to be grateful for that. It's unfortunate that it takes a tragedy like that for people to to, to stand up and and, and pay mm-hmm. attention. But the Logan Boulay effect is now the result has resulted in over two hundred thousand people signing the registry. Who, That's amazing. Who before that hadn't bothered? But that was an awareness issue. Yeah. Again, right? Yep. It's, it's only a matter of people knowing about it. And, and to be honest, I'm seeing more and more information being passed around and I'm seeing more commercials like I, I'm I'm encouraged. Yeah. Like it's really it's really great to see, especially because it's affected us for so long and now we're actually seeing the movement. So it's it's yeah. it's, it's pretty amazing. It is. Well we're gonna take a break and when we come back we'll continue our discussion with Mary Jo. I'm your host Bren Masson and we'll be back right after this. So stay tuned. You're listening to Fresh Waves. Hi, this is Bren Masson, host of Fresh Waves. April is Organ Donation Awareness Month in Canada. If you haven't already done so, please go to BeADonor.ca and register as an organ donor. It only takes a second, and it's a decision you'll never regret. Be a donor. Save a life. Go to BeADonor.ca. Today I'm going to try to change the world. We are back on Fresh Waves, and we're talking today with Mary Jo, and I'm going to try and say your last name. Bradis? You got it. There you go. Perfect. First I kind try. of did the, the uh, phonetic thing. Perfect. Which often doesn't work for me. It worked this time. It worked this time. <laughs> so there you go. So, Mary Jo, you are a kidney recipient. Yes. You were on dialysis for nine years. Almost nine years, yeah. And you got this, you did this documentary. How did it feel to be doing the documentary? I mean, it's one thing to tell a story, and especially in a, a, a nice atmosphere like radio where no one can see you and all the rest of us. And, and it, then you're doing a documentary. It was very that exposing. Could be to millions of people. And there you are in your PJs, getting into bed, hooking up your dialysis. That's a, that's a lot to ask of someone. Well, it didn't start out that way. We just kind of, you know, when they told us they wanted to promote awareness, I thought, absolutely, let's do this. Mm -hmm. Um, And then it just kind of turned into whatever it turned into. We didn't, there was no script for this. So they just followed us and and followed our our everyday lives living on dialysis. Um, So you wrote your own script because what you were saying in the, in the documentary was really well done. Thank you. There was no script. Yeah, this was just like, you know... Talking off the top of your head. Yeah. Like, you know, they just followed us. They followed us for about four years. And uh, I think one of the hardest things for me was when they actually filmed me putting my needles in. That 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 actually took over an hour. Um, editing, you never know what, what's going on mm-hmm. with editing. But uh, it was really hard. They had, there was a bunch of cameras in my room. Uh, and I was trying to, to put a needle into my arm. And, and what people don't understand is you have to get it into a certain spot in your vein in order for it to work. And if you don't, then, you know, the, the machine's going to beep and you're going to have all kinds of problems. So when you have a camera rolling and a microphone and uh, all this stuff in your face, and you're trying to find your vein and it's stressful. Yeah. It was very, very stressful, but it was important to me that we showed that part. Uh, I think it was important to everybody because I think yeah the non glamorous side of, of what nothing, dialysis really is. There's nothing glamorous. Yeah, exactly. there's nothing glamorous about it. And I didn't realize too the star. They actually took a photo of that and then they put it all over the Toronto Star. <laughs> so it was a uh, it was a very exposing time for me. Um, but I think it did exactly what it was supposed to do. So for that, I'm 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 grateful because uh, I know there's a lot of people who contacted me after that who were in similar situations and seeing something like that. They felt a little less alone, and I think that was the key: is is le- letting them know that there's so many people going through this, and uh, there is hope. There is people out there who want to help, and mm-hmm. this documentary, the whole point of it, really was just to promote awareness and let people make up their minds about what's going on. It wasn't guiding you either way; it was just giving you the information, saying, "Here, this is what's happening. What are you going to do about it?" Okay, so I have to apologize to Steve, who did send me an email during last week's show. And I didn't check email. I checked social media, but I didn't check my email. Um, his question was, how does it feel? Can you feel that you have another kidney? Yes. Because they can. don't take out the old ones. So now you've got three? I have three, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, and it's not necessarily that you feel it maybe it's a phantom kind of thing like i know it's there and there is a bit of a lump there as well so i can actually if i touch my stomach there there's a little bit of a lump so i know it's there and every once in a while you know you might feel 
a little something and you, you know, it, it could be in my head. I think, Oh my God, I feel, so, I feel my kidney. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know whether it's real or not. It's like when somebody loses a limb and they think they can still mm-hmm. feel their arm. Like it's kind of like that, but you're always aware. You're, you're always aware it's there. Like it's not something uh, you're ever going to forget. You, you know, when you're, you're not going to take it for granted. No, it, it's it's a part of every day of my life when I uh, when I'm planning to travel, when I'm looking at what I'm going to eat. If I go and I have a couple of drinks, I'm very very aware that uh, you know I have a kidney and I can't do that kind of thing. So yeah, you, you pay attention. You definitely pay attention to everything because you have to, right? But it's a good thing because it ama- means that you're alive today and you're not hooked up to a machine. I'm not hooked up to a machine, and I have the opportunity to do things that I I honestly wouldn't have had before. So, I mean, since I had my transplant, I've had obviously my, my son, uh, I've traveled all around the world. Um, and I've just been able to do, like I went, I've gone, I just went to Costa Rica in January. I jumped off a waterfall. Like I, I'm doing things that I wouldn't have had the opportunity to do. Mm-hmm. So when you woke up, how did you feel? Scared scared because I was, I had a lot of tubes in me at the time, um, you know, like you, you go to, you go to bed, you go to sleep and you wake right. up and, and something's happened. And I had, uh, I had tubes coming out of me from everywhere and you don't know whether it's working. I mean, it, it's scary at first, right? Cause you, you want to know that it's worked. And, and after spending nine years on a machine, you don't really know what to expect. Right. So, and, and you and, know, the machine was okay. You know, the machine was keeping you alive, but this new thing, it's well, it became like, a routine wow. too, yeah. right? It was something that you got used to. And I hate to say that, but yeah, I got used to it and I, you kind of develop a lifestyle around it. Mm-hmm. So now all of a sudden everything has changed again for the yeah. better, but you don't know that yet. Nine years is a long time. Yeah, it, so it is. When you first, when you realized it was working and everything was, but you, you, you're not, it's not working right away because then you go through the immunosuppressant drug period, right? right. So your body has to get used to that. And it, it's a bit of a process. Um, and you, you have to, everything has think, thankfully we have some great doctors who mm-hmm. help you tweak that process because everybody's different right um you know and i gained i think i gained 25 pounds overnight in water so that was interesting but uh then that all goes away and uh and and life just gets better and better you know it's it's a process getting used to the fact that you're no longer on a machine how did it feel at night like or at your home when you went home and you didn't have to hook up at night well i still had the machine i kept the machine because i was still scared yeah so i kept the machine probably for the first month uh, because I still didn't believe that, uh, I, it was done. Uh, I think the happiest moment for me is when they actually came to my house and, and t- took the machine and un- they, they, they removed all of the plumbing, they removed everything and I, it was gone. Like I no longer had to have supplies delivered to my house. I never, like there was a routine that went with doing dialysis at home. Mm-hmm. So when that was officially taken away, uh, that's when it really kicked in for me that I was like, Oh my God, I, I don't have to do this anymore. So, and then, uh, you know, a uh, month becomes two months, becomes three months, a year. Like, you know, every time you reach a, an anniversary date, it's, it's kind of a big deal. And I, yeah. you know, I just, uh, I'm going on nine years in October. My brother's going on 10. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's huge. And for us, it's, it's bittersweet because my mom died. Um, uh, and you know, she's not, she's not, here to, to, to share these little victories with us. And she went through the same thing. So it's, it's, it's bittersweet, Mm -hmm. but we, uh, we definitely, we think about her all the time. I can imagine she'd be really proud of you guys. Yeah. Well, we're proud of her too. She's a strong woman. She's Mm -hmm. incredibly tough. I mean, to live 26 years on a machine. I I don't know. I, I, I was nine and I was ready to call it quits. So yeah, I, I respect anybody who can go through that and still inspire other people and keep a smile on their face because I see a lot of really amazing people. I go back to St. Michael's um, regularly um, just to visit some of the patients who still knew my mom. And I, me and my son hand out Christmas dinners to the dialysis patients every year. Um, and it's, you know, we put a picture up right over her old chair because she was there for when she's one of the longest patients there. Mm-hmm. So I don't want her to be forgotten, you know. And Yeah, uh, she wouldn't be. No, she had a pretty big personality. So no, nobody's forgotten her. She's, she's still very much there. So yeah, <laughs> that's great. And how does your son feel about all this? My son doesn't know a lot about it, to be honest. Uh, he never saw me on dialysis. Oh, okay. I, I hid it from him. I think for, I just, it wasn't something I thought he needed to really see. 
Right. And whether that's right or wrong, I don't know. But at the time, I just didn't want to include him in it. He was a bit, he was, he was such a, he was little. He was little. Yeah. I think when I got my transplant, he was, uh, was eight years. So he's only four. So he never saw it. And he hasn't seen the documentary either. So he doesn't really know that side of my life. He knows about organ donation. He knows that I have a kidney. Um, but he never saw the dark side of it. And when he's older, maybe, you know, we'll sit down and we'll watch it together. But at this point, uh, we focus on the good things. The good things. Yeah. And he, he does, he does know that I speak at high schools. He knows, he knows a lot about organ donation and how important it is. And when he gets his license, he'll make that decision as well. Um, but yeah, I, I, I've kind of hidden that from him so far. Yeah. Then don't let him listen to the repeat show. Again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he'll he'll figure it out eventually. It's yeah, just, you he know, certainly it's not, will. It's not something that comes up for us because we 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 travel, we do lots of other stuff. Hi, this is Bren Masson, host of Fresh Waves. April is Organ Donation Awareness Month in Canada. If you haven't already done so, please go to beadonor.ca and register as an organ donor. It only takes a second, and it's a decision you'll never regret. Be a donor. Save a life. Go to beadonor.ca. Today I'm going to try to change the world. And we're back on Fresh Waves. I'm your host, Bren Masson, and we're talking with Mary Jo. Joining us on the line right now is Rick, who is the director of the documentary Tales from the Organ Trade. And it's, it's kind of sounds like a Disney title, but I can guarantee you it's really not. You think that no, sounds like a Disney title? Disney. <laughs> Tales from the Organ Trade. You think of some little mouse playing an organ and... <laughs> oh God, no, yeah. <laughs> no, no, this is a different thing altogether. And the, the visual on the front of the cover of the DVD oh. is actually quite astounding. It's a, it's a donor. Yeah, it's a donor, it's a, but he got paid. That's correct. It's a, it's actually a gentleman from the Philippines who uh, sold his... His kidney, because he was in desperate need of money. So, uh, you know, we, we took pictures we filmed in in the Philippines and and uh, well, in lots of places in Turkey and um, and um, and of course we filmed in Toronto with uh, with Mary Jo. Well, there's four stories. I was I was the one person in in the film that was still on dialysis versus. Uh, well, Rick can probably tell you more about the people that she used. In the that she used. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I was the I was the one who kind of waited for a, a yeah. transplant versus somebody who goes through the process of, of purchasing one and what that looks like. Yes, and purchasing is that still a thing, or did your documentary kind of just blow that whole thing out of the water? Well, I mean, it's always been illegal, and I mean, I shouldn't say it's always been illegal, but it has been illegal for quite some time, and it's still illegal. And uh, actually, it wasn't uh, just the film, but what was interesting is. Uh, when I started uh, making this film, I thought it was really a black and white issue of exploitation. And then we met Mary Jo and started to understand really the realities of what it's like to be on dialysis, to try and have a regular life while you're while you're on dialysis. And if you are someone who is in your 60s and you're a man, uh, in your 60s, it, the chances of you getting a kidney there's such a dire shortage of organs the chances of you getting a kidney aren't that great and as you continue to survive on dialysis your your health actually gets worse so this is kind of the what propels people towards the black market if they have the wherewithal and the funds to do it so one it was a bit of a revelation to me that it wasn't always evil people and exploitative exploitative people who were just trying to take advantage of the impoverished It was usually someone who was absolutely desperate in the West who suddenly said, wait a minute, if I can find someone and pay them and I can make their life better and they can make my life better, maybe that's an equal trade. I'm not trying to whitewash the issue, but that was a revelation to me when I started meeting people who were considering going overseas, that they weren't kind of, uh, you know, evil incarnate. And uh, and Mary Jo felt like, like all, most of us that it's unethical and she was going to wait it out. And Mary Jo is very lucky, but also young, healthy. I mean, w- when you see Mary Jo in the film, I mean, Mary Jo, you're incredible. Just you're, you know, you have a child, you have a special needs child, you, so you have a family, you're at the center and the core of your family, not only 
of your own family and and your child, but also your mother. So you take on quite a lot, and you were able to do it while on dialysis, and you were able to do self dialysis at home. So that is you know a, a, a combo that that um, isn't all that common, right? There's lots of people going to dialysis centers, uh, being stuck for six hours, who aren't as healthy and as vibrant as, as Mary Jo was. Um, anyway, I can babble on about this for hours, but yeah, basically well, in, in making the film, I, I it would, you go ahead, you ask questions. Well, I was just going to say that when I watched the, the film, it's exactly what you said. I went in there with the attitude of this is wrong. There's nothing that can ever make it right. It's just darn wrong. And I can see how it would just be totally exploitive of people who are really impoverished. And then when you think of all of the strict regulations of that someone as a living donor here goes through in order to make sure that they're healthy enough, that they, they eat the right things, that the organ is in its best. But these people are starving to death in a third world country, living in a shack in squalid conditions. How can their organ possibly be as good as it needs to be? And I had all this preconceived notion of what I was going to see in the documentary. And then when I saw the documentary, I thought, completely differently i think yeah well i mean that's what happened to me the documentary in a way arcs my own experience because the film i made prior to this was about sex trafficking and there was no moral ambiguity there it was just black and white yep and traveling through turkey and filming in ukraine that's when i came across the concept of organ trafficking not that it was new but that's when i became more kind of cognizant of it and thought it was worthy of, of making a film so i thought it was going to be the same kind of going down that same dark road but as i kind of meandered my way through that world of organ trafficking it it made me question uh, all of my kind of previous thoughts about what is moral and what isn't moral for example if you are willing to give your organ if i was willing to to donate my kidney to somebody, I am considered heroic, and I would be, like you said, properly tested to make sure I was an appropriate donor and that I wasn't endangering my own life, never mind making sure the kidney was good enough for a recipient. But if there was the minute money exchanges hands, it completely changes that transaction. Mm -hmm. And that became very interesting to me because I thought, well, if I was impoverished and I couldn't feed my kids, maybe selling my kidney isn't the worst thing in the world. It's better than prostituting my daughter. It's better than living on the streets. So, I mean, it was just such a weird transition. And I don't, you know, I don't want to, you know, I have my own conclusions, but what I wanted to do with viewers is have them just take a look at it and really see, you know, what it's like in that world and, and you know, come to your own conclusions. But, I mean, I was, it was actually, there was some criticism of the film because it wasn't a complete, um, I mean, it wasn't a whitewash of the black market because the black market is by definition bad. There's no checks and balances, no one's properly tested, but because it wasn't an out and out condemnation, basically. Um, and, you know, through Mary Jo's family, well, one of the reasons that Mary Jo, first of all, I adore her and she's a superstar, mm-hmm. but I, I think it's through Mary Jo's experience and her family experience that I think viewers start to really understand the meaning of living with um, with kidney disease and and it, it was integral to the film and to the emotion of the film to understand how challenging it is because mm-hmm. if it was just a question of taking a pill like you know you keep your blood pressure down by taking a pill you know if, if that was it then you know you wouldn't even consider going overseas. I mean, Mary Jo didn't consider it anyway, though it's something that we talked about, but it was really important to understand because even I didn't understand. I knew what dialysis was kind of, but I never really understood what it does to the body that you have to do it X many times a week, you know, and, and how um, life altering it is. You right. have to endure that. Well, I think that's one of the best things about the film is that it's so multifaceted. Even yeah. even when it comes to the story of the couple who did buy from the black market, they yeah. weren't um, horned, winged devils sitting in there that you could kind of think of them as the villains who are adding to this whole what could be a problem of black market organ dealing. They were regular, nice people. They were really nice people, both of them. They were desperate. They wanted a life, and 
they have that life now. Well, and they weren't trying to take advantage of anybody. No, I think weren't. the idea, and this this brought some light to me as well, as I thought, okay, if I'm going to pay, I am going to make somebody's life better. And I think what I saw in this film, because I again I hadn't seen it until it was it was Finished. out there, um, the people who you think are getting the money are not. And I think exactly. that was that was part of the thing that I didn't understand. And the brokers, and, exactly. Like there were so many parts to this that just aren't well known and I and that's what I one of the parts I really loved about the film is it exposed that part mm-hmm. um and showed it's just, it's not black like and white. if you were going to just as a figure I'm not even sure what the the number is but say you were going to spend fifty thousand dollars on an organ you would expect that that money would go to the person donating or you, the you majority would, you would of it when in fact it doesn't but that's the part of the problem yeah. with the black market well mm-hmm. no and the part that it's illegal i mean what if there is somebody out there who does want to give you a kidney and this happened to me i had two people who wanted to donate and one was a single mother so part of her issue was that she would have to take probably six weeks off of work because it's actually way worse on the donor than it is on the recipient right um and how would she pay for it and so because i'm not able to give her any money because it has to be an altruistic donation she couldn't do it and then I had another friend who wanted to donate, and then he was going to be canceled from his life insurance. Because if he, you know, so these are the things that people don't think about. And I, I think it raises the question of whether it should be legal or, or some changes need to be made to the system in order to allow people to actually donate, but be able to take care of themselves after they do. You know right. what I mean? This is why the black market is flourishing. You know what I mean? Because we don't have options. To be honest, That's if I had right. to go down this road again... I don't know that I would spend another nine years on dialysis. The thought of doing that now n- scares me. Yeah. It scares me. Yeah. You know, I, especially as an older person. And I can appreciate Raul in the film, you know, at that stage in his life, not wanting to wait a, a decade to get a, right. to possibly get a kidney. Possibly. Yes, possibly. That's the key well, word. Well, because who knows what his, his health is going to be like by that time. Right. You know, I was still young enough. Like, and I was 30... 32 i think when i got my kidney so imagine now yeah. if i wait another 10 years i'll be 50 what's my health going to be like then and i am i going to be a healthy recipient mm-hmm. you know what i mean so there's there's so many things to consider here right. that are being ignored really right i agree and it's interesting because when i you know i spoke to the look i don't know what the solution is i mean i'm a filmmaker right i'm not an ethicist and i'm not a surgeon but uh some of the people that i spoke to in the states i ended up pulling all of the um experts out of the film and keeping it stories but some of the experts who were arguing for a regulated system in north america were saying that basically the way they envision it working i'm not suggest i'm not i'm not promoting this i'm just suggest I'm just, just you're relating. telling a story Right. Yeah, I'm telling a story that let's say uh, there would be a kidney bank. Because so I would go and I'd say to this kidney bank, I'm happy to I, I'm happy to, to give my kidney and you give me money or pay my mortgage or whatever we whatever the powers that be would deem ethically less complicated. And they would test just compensate me, go, me for the six weeks that I have to take off at the very least, <laughs> or even more than the six weeks. I mean, this is their argument: is make it worth someone's loss since we have such a dire problem and it's such a cost to the system and we're willing to pay for dialysis we're paying everybody to be on dialysis mm-hmm. you know it's worth uh, it, you save money even by compensating people to the tune of fifty thousand dollars or a hundred whatever that threshold would be but that i would say i'm going to give my kidney but not sell it on the free market i'm i'm going to get tested by this kidney bank and they're going to go you know what that her kidney is perfect and then they would find a match and everything would be anonymous but it would be the state that would run it. Now, obviously, that has its own problems, but that's how they deem it, kind of finding an ethical way to make it work, because then the, my kidney would be given to the person most appropriate on the list, who's the closest match, who's been on dialysis the longest. But it's not a, it's not a, a, a deal that I would be making privately with somebody. I think that's brilliant. The problem is, is that, you, you know, nobody who's going to go to sell their kidney at the kidney bank is going to be affluent. Right. So it's it's kind of are we comfortable with impoverished people going to offer up their kidneys? Uh, You know, we we've gone away from selling blood. Right. We now donate blood. We used to sell blood. But then there was a movement saying it's unethical and the blood you're getting isn't as good. So they you know, the fact that we think about donating blood, that was a concerted effort by 
a lobby to make that the norm. So all these questions, it was so fascinating for me to get inside all of it because there's no easy answers no but you can bop back and forth and you know i spoke to some very um established like a philosopher from oxford who was basically absolutely a hundred percent for a regulated compensation system and she is so highly respected but that's such a controversial view and she also kept saying to me well why are you okay to take my kidney but you're not i'm not i'm not uh, you know, it's not okay for me to benefit in any way. Um, why does the doctor benefit? He's getting paid for the operation, and the nurse and the anesthesiologist. There's so, and even the res- the recipient of the kidney benefits by getting a new life. Why is it so verboten for the person giving it to profit in any way? So it's like, wow, I never thought of it that way. It is true. Everybody, you know, so uh, again, it's it, I for me, I feel actually that it's a great example for ethics classes and medical ethics and legal ethics to discuss these kinds of things because there's no easy answers. But it comes down to when it comes down to life and death. This is what, you know, I when the film came out. And Mary Jo came to some of these. We did a lot of talks or, or Q&As at, after screenings and things like that. And, and I don't want to take a stand, but as a human being and as a filmmaker, I kept thinking, if my daughter, for example, what, if it was life and death for my daughter and I couldn't get her a kidney, would I consider buying a kidney even though I, I don't like the idea? And the answer for me was yes. Absolutely. Because it's life and death. So I thought. And it's personal. And that's what I said. That's what I challenged everybody in the audience who criticized it. I said, you just have to ask yourself, what would you do in a life or death situation? I mean, I'm not talking about, you know, killing somebody to get a kidney. I'm not talking about that. That I wouldn't do. Right. That's unethical. So that was for me the turning point when I put myself in Raul's shoes, like you just said, Mary Jo. I mean, you were young. If I was, uh, you know, 60 year old man and my chances of getting a kidney were nil. And basically it was like I either this is my life or I can go and try and compensate somebody. All of these guys want it to be legal so that their recipients are properly tested and compensated and followed up with, you know? So anyway, it's a, it's really food for thought. And I just challenge anyone who takes an absolute stand to take, to watch the film and not feel both for the people who are need the kidneys, but even for the impoverished where they go, yeah, it sucks that I have to do this. But it's better than my other options. So, I mean, I think if we eradicate poverty, that's even better than having to sell your kidney, obviously. But, you know, the reality is um, that life isn't that simple, you know. Well, and I think also it would all, uh, they have to, you have to consider the fact that a lot of these, there's a story in there, too, that shows the one guy who donated and then didn't have proper follow up care. You know, like if this was more of a legal route, then at least they would be taken care of. Mm -hmm. And he ended up getting really sick. He was really sick. Well, and it wasn't properly tested. And, you know, like, so those are are the other things you have to be concerned about. If you're desperate enough to have to go down this road, what are the risks that are involved now because you've had to, you've, you've had to be pushed into this situation? Right. And then he ended up with kidney disease in the only kidney he had left. Well, and he donated do- a diseased a, kidney. A diseased kidney was donated. Yeah. Exactly. So, but think about what it took for somebody to have to go down that road in the first place. Yep. It's terrible. And also, I mean, there are many cases in India where you have some impoverished villager selling a kidney by some unscrupulous uh, broker or doctor getting $500, uh, you know, having a huge scar instead of them doing it laparoscopically scopically like they can now and then going back to the village and it gets infected and they take all their money to to, to i mean they can't work because they're laborers and because the scar is so big and they end up no further ahead because it's black market so there are terrible stories as well um and anyway that's that's what i think made uh made uh the film um kind of more interesting more complex raised a lot of questions i mean obviously the best solution they're working on um um uh, i was going to say fake kidneys that's not the word but lab you know kidneys that are made in the lab elect- not electronic i don't know stem the word cell it. stem cell Pardon me? stem cell 
like they're, they're trying it's to either stem cells or even grow. just a, a fake just like they make heart valves right like if they can come up with something else there's another uh con- a solution uh that's great but in the meantime you know i spoke to the world health organization and they were talking about prevention because people are eating really badly in the west uh, kidney disease is on the rise the demand is going up not down and they're talking about prevention and prevention is eating better you know less sugar or whatever it whatever whatever uh you need to do to keep yourself healthy but prevention doesn't help people who are now you know in dialysis centers um and uh, that's a very it's, it's a very complex issue yeah there's no there's no straightforward answer but i think again one of the best things about this film is it gets you to think you know that was the whole point of it yeah it certainly does that and it does educate yeah it does educate i mean even just knowing a more realistic look of what dialysis really is, mm-hmm. you know? Well, and like I said, I've been contacted over the years by all different types of people and not just people who want to offer me kidneys, but also people who are already on dialysis and waiting and who were inspired to see the story and see that I got a kidney at the end of it and sort of see that they're not alone. And I mean, I, I've kept all these letters and uh you know emails that i've received and it's uh this is because you know i was approached by a director to promote awareness right so and it's gone around the world so it's a it's a pretty amazing thing really is the month of april has opened my eyes to things that i have never thought about in my life to sadnesses and tragedies that i don't like to consider because they're uncomfortable but to inspiring stories that i can't tell you how are so inspiring that make me smile that make me leave this studio and think wow i want to jump up and click my heels together and say isn't this a fabulous world it's um it's a total roller coaster i can't imagine what making this film was like because you know you're you're wallowing in the black market and then the next minute you're kind of talking to mary joe about dialysis and things and at the end of the film we get a little snippet of the fact that you know before this film aired mary joe did get her transplant and you know mary joe now and oh, it must be God, just yes. wonderful to to know someone who just loves life so much and you can see it in her face and in her eyes no, Mary Jo's a remarkable human being. Like I said to her, normally when I make films, I don't end up becoming friends with the people. I mean, you end up very close, but you don't, you know, you, 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 life moves on. But Mary Jo is a completely special person. And, uh, and, um, I am kind of so grateful that I had the opportunity to meet with her. But for absolutely this joie de vivre that even was apparent before the kidney. And also she just astounds me, her simple strength and her, just zest for life you're absolutely right so um you know when you think about whoever um who's ever whoever she got that kidney from man has it been put to good use i mean you know mary Jo, you've embraced it you've traveled you just you're just you know you're an amazing human being but also an amazing advocate for this issue it's not just that she got a kidney mary Jo speaks in schools and and awareness is so important because people just don't know right that's why you know that's why i love making films we all do we all kind of communicate in our own way but it's like how do you get word out when you get word out then people become attuned to specific topics and and open to more you know to discussions and and maybe open to donating or open to lobbying or open to becoming involved so we need more mary joes (laughs) <laughs> oh, see, you know why I love her so much. <laughs> <laughs> She's very complimentary. Well, the people I've met in the last month are are certainly incredibly inspiring, and it it's it warms your heart. And yeah, I think donors need to know how appreciative, or the donor families, when it's a cadaver donor situation, the donor families need to know how appreciate appreciated that act of of kindness and the uh, gift of life how yeah. precious it is absolutely mm. and even you know what was interesting so even when i tracked down like part of the film one big thread in the film is following this black market operation that happened in kosovo where you know this was truly an international organ trafficking ring where the recipients were flown in from all over the world as were the donors as was the doctor so uh i was trying to track down all the players from one single operation 
And that was a revelation to me, too, because when I tracked down a doctor, he's called Dr. Frankenstein, who's the Turkish yes. doctor. He's known as the mm-hmm. most notorious organ trafficking doctor in the world. He's like a guy who thinks he's saving lives. Now, I'm not saying he wasn't disingenuous when I interviewed him, but it's true. He is saving lives. I mean, that was the, that was the, the kind of irony is that, you know, everyone goes, he's making tons of money and he, and he is making money. There's no doubt about it, but he's a brilliant surgeon in his own right. He's acknowledged by his own peers in Turkey as being one of the top surgeons in Turkey. So it's not like he wouldn't have made a living. If he didn't do the black market, he also put himself so, at risk by doing it, though, right? He's wanted by Interpol. Like it's he's still wanted by Interpol, by the way. He's on the run. I haven't been able to get hold of him since the mm-hmm. film was finished. I've tried because I wanted to send it to him. I did uh, get it to the Israeli doctor who was involved and who also spoke in the film, uh, who has been indicted since uh, on on other charges and and uh, you know. But but it's just it's an interesting world where. Um, it's like the, the, the evil guys were saving lives and the kind of self-righteous doctors who were saying this is illegal and it's exploitative were actually resulting in people's deaths. And it mix, it mixed me up, but it makes for a very, uh, you know, interesting for filmically. It's interesting, but also I, I really did feel it was important for people to feel that when they watch the film. I mean, it's a very good story, too. Obviously, you make a film, it's got to be interesting to watch. But I really, it made me question my own ethical assumptions. And I think that's a worthwhile endeavor. But there's a lot of other complexities. It's just there's so many things you can't do in a film. For example, if you're a parent, because you're allowed to give an organ, if you're a parent or a sibling and you need an organ, if you have four kids and three of them are parents and gainfully employed and one is a little bit of a ne'er-do-well, who do you think the pressure is on to donate a kidney? So there's all sorts of other ethical issues that people don't consider. And... Mm. You know, doctors actually, surgeons told me that they have an out. When there is a family member who's being put forward as a potential recipient, the doctor will have a private meeting with them and say, do you really want to do this? Because if you're feeling worried or you don't want to, I will give you a medical out. Mm. So the doctors are willing to lie because there's an understanding that there's undue pressure sometimes. Yes, on the member of the family that's not producing the most. (laughs) Or yeah. doesn't have children. So yep. I'm just saying, you know, there are a lot of things to consider. Is that okay? Is that ethically correct? You know, and, uh, and, and, and the doctor from Israel had said, you know, he saw it happen before where suddenly the kid who donates a kidney gets a condo from their parents. I mean, meaning we're not controlling everything we think we're controlling. So, you know, I mean, I hope, uh, I hope more people become aware of this issue and then, and at least sign your organ donor cards because obviously, never mind donating live, but so many people have not signed their donor cards. The chances of you giving your organ are actually, I think, lower than the chances of you needing one because you have to die in a certain way and it has to be an accident. You have to have a healthy organ. But, uh, the fact that people, that we don't have, uh, a system in Canada where it's assumed that everyone's an organ donor upon death is beyond to be honest. Yeah, yeah that's me too. Very strongly about. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. Well, thank you for ending on that note because I think that's a good note to end on. I think the, the whole purpose of the last four shows that we've done throughout the month of April is be a donor. Go to beadonor.ca. At least educate and register. yourself on what it is. Yeah, mm-hmm. register. Go to my website, freshwaves.ca. Thank you so much for making the film. Uh, thank you for thank talking you. to us this morning on such short notice. We really appreciate it. And boy, would I ever like to have you as a guest to talk about all kinds of different things, including filmmaking in this country. Ah, just call anytime. Well, we'd love to have you on again. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. All right, thanks a lot, Ricky. We really appreciate it. Bye, all Rick. Right, bye. 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 Well, that's it for another episode of Fresh Waves. I'd like to say thank you to Mary Jo. This is the second year in a row that you've honored us with your presence on an you organ donation show. We're really, really happy to have you. And I'm very blessed this year to be able to speak to you in a one-on-one situation where we got to actually find out about you. Thank and thanks you. for doing that film. That was really brave of you, and it needs to be acknowledged. Thank you. No, I'm I, I'm actually honored that I was a part of it because yeah. uh, it was a, an eye-opening experience for me as well. Terrific. So thanks for listening, everyone. Take care. 
be kind to one another. That's an Ellen thing, but I can I can snag it because you can't you can't patent that, you know. So be kind to one another. Have a wonderful day and enjoy the spring.